Hi, welcome to Here to Them, hosted by Carolyn Takeda, former attorney, current small groups pastor, and life coach. Through monthly conversations with pastors, authors, and guests, we hope to stir your thoughts and encourage you to move from where you are to where you want to be, in your personal life, in your leadership, or in your ministry. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Here to There, where we explore movement from our present reality to the preferred future that God has for us. Well, when I was in law school in my early 20s, I was assigned a dorm suite mate. Uh, her name was Karen, and she became a close lifelong friend. We actually became friends because I didn't like my roommate very much, so we hung out because um, she was next door, hung out a lot. And what was unique about Karen and the blessing in my life was that she was the first Catholic person that I had met, a friend who deeply loved Jesus. She sought to walk in obedience with his teachings. We talked about the Bible a lot. We prayed together. Um, she was also really committed to the practices of her Catholic Church, which I found fascinating because that was so uh, new to me. And so she became my teacher on all things Catholic, and then I I became her teacher on the Protestant stuff, um, but we just developed this really sweet friendship based on our shared faith in Christ. So, but since then, aside from going to weddings and funerals and confirmations and things in the Catholic Church, I've had very little interaction with the church. Um, and in our area here locally, we have very little overlap in ministry between the Catholic churches and our non-denominational Protestant churches. Um, aside from doing a homeless uh, shelter together or feedings or other mercy ministries, we really don't do a whole lot um, as a shared faith community. So when I heard about a Catholic church that had a vibrant groups ministry, I was really curious and I was fascinated about how um, groups would work in that context. So I wanted to learn more and I invited Kelly Lippenholtz, who I met at the Small Group Network Lobby back in February's conference, to share her experiences and learnings with us. Um, and they have led a successful group launch, and she has so much uh, interesting stuff. So I am so excited to have this conversation with you, Kelly. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, you're welcome, Carolyn. Great to be here with you. I'm so excited to get to talk about small groups with you. Yeah, so um, Kelly, let me tell you a little bit about her. She began her career in ministry at the Church of Nativity, which is a parish in the Archdiocese of Baltimore, Maryland, where she began volunteering with the youth ministry program and led a group of sixth grade girls. And those girls are now in college, and Kelly is in her 10th year of ministry. Um, six years with youth ministry, writing curriculum, delivering messages, planning retreats, and training 200 next-gen ministers which is very cool. A few years ago, she transitioned into her current role at Nativity as the Director of Adult Discipleship, where she oversees several ministries, including small groups, member care, missions, and adult ministry. That That's a lot. <laughs> Yeah, that's a big job, but I'm not doing it all myself. We have a director of ministry, a director of missions, director of small groups, and a director of member care. So I just bring those four people together, and then we all collaborate ah. with all of our programs. See that? I already know now that you're an excellent leader because that's how it's done. You delegate to really capable people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's great. Um, well, Kelly, how did you first hear about the small group network? Because uh, we don't have a lot of Catholic churches in our network. Yeah, well, we have somebody very special on our staff who is our director of small group ministry. Her name is Susan, and she found the small group network. She's, you know, she's alone in ministry, not alone in ministry, but she's right. the only person working in small groups, which I'm sure most churches only have one yes. person. And she's got, you know, 2,000 sheep that she leads. <laughs> and so she's always looking for support and encouragement and to learn mm. more. And so through that, she found the small group network. So she's been participating in a huddle for um, a couple of years. She's been on staff for about four years now. So she's oh, been wow. participating in a huddle and um, she, this is how we, we really found our way to small group network more intimately was um, after COVID, we were feeling that burnout, especially mm. small group people of not being able to gather people yes. together. And so she found a conference called Accelerate mm -hmm. on the small group network's website. And she said, she sent me a text one weekend. She said, can we go to this? I need to go to something. And I said, <laughs> Let's see if we can figure it out. And so together we went to Accelerate, which was amazing. Highly recommended. Wow. If you're a point person or a discipleship person at your church, go to Accelerate. That's so great. Uh, we just came back on fire for our jobs and at, at a time that we were feeling really mm. burned out. 
kind of low. And soon after that, we scheduled to host a TAIN here um, at Nativity. Oh, wow. And we nice. just hosted the first attain outside of Saddleback. We just hosted that. Yeah, because that's a brand new program that we just launched yeah. this year. Oh, I didn't realize you guys had hosted. That's awesome. Yeah, it was on February 4th. We had 250 people attend. Um, and so it, it was great. And so we're just, um, that's how we, we found the small group network. And now we're just, we're hundred percent in Carolyn. <laughs> well, yeah. And then you made the trek out from Maryland to California to, to meet lots more people at the lobby. And, um, I had several people say, you need to talk to Kelly. And so I was like, yes, this is, I think part of it is we are fascinated and so excited about what God is doing, um, in small groups in your context. So tell us a little bit about your spiritual journey. Journey. Um, did you grow up in the Catholic Church? I did. I am what we call a cradle Catholic, just meaning <laughs> I was born into a Catholic family with devout parents, and we did all the Catholic things that we were supposed to do. We went to church on Sunday, and we did our our CCD, which was our mm -hmm. religious education. If we didn't go to the, a religious school or a Catholic school, mm -hmm. um, but as typical with with most most Catholics, I think, or many Catholics, I won't say most. That's that's too. <laughs> Um, but with my family and most of the cultural ca Catholics that I knew, we were just going through the motions and, uh, it was a great foundation and okay. it still brought me peace to, to know that there was a God up there listening to my prayers. But, mm -hmm. um, once I went to college, I kept going through the motions. Um, and then right after college, I just was like, so disenchanted maybe is the word. Like there's gotta be more to faith than just going to church on Sunday. I would go late and leave early. I just didn't understand what was happening. And then um, when I was about 30, a good friend of mine invited me to a Bible study at a local non-denominational church. And I had two little babies. And so I thought, yeah, they got child care. I'll study the Bible for some <laughs> <laughs> I did something very similar, and that's how I ended up at, the, at my current church. But yes, that that don't underestimate the power of child care for stay-at-home moms at that stage of life. <laughs> oh, true! It's such a great even like evangelization tool. It is. Um, and so I did Bible study for five years at that church, and I started mm. attending that church. It was non-denominational, um, but I just missed I missed the structure of the Catholic Church. Mm. There, there just felt like something was missing for me, um, which was, you know, the Eucharist and, and just really um, holding that Eucharist so sacred um, as the body of Christ. And um, and I, I wanted some structure for my kids. They were going every week, but they would just like go in a room and play. And I'm not saying that all de non denominational right, right. just do that, but I wanted more. And because of my upbringing in the Catholic Church, that's where I saw structure. Um, mm. So the same friend who was at the non-denominational church invited me to try Church of the Nativity because she had heard good things about this Catholic church. Um, so I did. And I started going, I was going to both churches for a while. And my husband was like, <laughs> what are you doing? Pick a church. <laughs> uh, so eventually I did um, commit myself and my family to Nativity. And shortly after doing that, um, the director of ministry at the time invited me into my first small group Woo. and then she invited me into ministry after I did my first small group for about six months. And then I, I was invited to join the staff shortly after that. So my faith story is a tale of invitations at the right mm. time. Oh, that's a beautiful way to put it. So when you stepped into Nativity, they already had a small group structure. Is that unusual for a Catholic church or I just hadn't heard of that before. Is that typical? Yeah. So I don't really know the history well, but I do know I'm going to somebody out there, Catholic who's listening is going to be like, she doesn't know anything about the history of the church. <laughs> Okay, big dis right. well, let's let's throw a disclaimer up front. Kelly is not yeah, an expert on all things Catholic, so yeah. it's okay. But I do know that, like back in the '80s, there was there was like a push to do small groups, and that people did mm. small group. I don't know how they did it, or what kind of curriculum they were using, or what the vision was for it. Um, but I think small groups have have been around in the Catholic Church for a long time. When I came here, we it, it was just starting. I think we started mm. with like two groups, two small groups. And how big is the church then? 
uh, back then, that was probably 15 years ago. I mean, maybe like 3,000, 2,000 to 3,000 wow. people. Wow. Okay. So it really was a, a little, um, a little start. It was a very small start. And then, you know, what we ended up doing was, um, one year about, uh, when was this maybe 12 years ago, we did, uh, the purpose driven life mm. and we read the book together and that was the beginning of the beginning. Like yes. people, we gave out the book for free. Right. There was a book that we were all going to be reading together. You got a free book. If you joined a group, everybody was doing the same curriculum. So that was, mm -hmm. um, that was a really, uh, a big, uh, moment for starting small groups at our church a while ago. Yeah. And around the world, actually, that was a huge start for a lot of churches, kind of introduction to small groups by using a campaign, what we now call campaign model, but really was just doing the same, studying the same, and then encouraging people to talk to each other about it. Um, yeah. So that had started. So when you, uh, when you stepped into that first small group, what I'm just curious about what your experience of it, because if it was your first group, what were you expecting and what was it like for you? Um, I, I don't remember having any expectations, but it was all ages of people. Mm. And I just remember really loving that there were younger people in the group who had such wisdom to share and older people in the group, older, much older than me who had, a lot of wisdom to share. And, um, you know, up until that point, I was, I didn't, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I, I mean, except what I had started to study at this non-denominational church, I didn't know anything about community. I didn't know that discipleship really happens in community. I didn't mm -hmm. know about seeking wise counsel. Um, and so that was all brand new to me and I loved it. I just, there was an 18 year old girl in the group who one, one, week said that pride was the root of all sin. And I've just never forgotten it. And I feel like she was right. Like so many, so many sins in my life are pride. And so I can like intentionally pray about pride now. And that was from an 18 year old. And I was, you know, in my thirties. That's cool. That's so cool. All right. So how does the small groups ministry fit in to the vision and life of nativity? Well, um, Great question. About 10 years ago, no, more than that now, probably about 15 years ago when I was first coming here, the pastor here and the associate to the pastor um, began to, well, they were kind of lamenting the Catholic churches in this corridor where I, where we live in Baltimore. We're in North Baltimore County, a lot of Catholic churches mm -hmm. up and down this one route um, in, in the area. And they were closing and they were dying. Oh. Churches were dying and churches were merging. And they said, why, why is the Catholic church struggling while these non-denominational churches are packing the house? What are they doing? And so they began studying Willow Creek and Saddleback mm -hmm. and North Point and kind of discovered that uh, some of the things that those churches were doing that were creating some success and bringing people to Jesus in a different way mm -hmm. that they hadn't considered before. And they got a lot of pushback and they had some pushback themselves because, um, yeah, it's you know, different. it's different. And, uh, you know, a lot of Catholics love the tradition and, and mm -hmm. our pastor loves the tradition, but he saw so is it a pastor. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I had to ask, is he a pastor, not a priest? He's a priest, but you know, I guess the oh. general definition of pastor is someone who cares for people. So, oh, he's okay. both. so you guys oh. use them, use both interchangeably. We do. So they, they began studying other churches and what was successful at other churches and, um, and small groups was part of that. I mean, the, the music was part of that. Preaching in a message series was part of that. Having mm. great hospitality around the weekend and welcoming outsiders was a big part of that. Wow. But small groups, um, that's sort of where that was discovered that, you know, how important community is. I don't think, you know, again, my experience just mine of being Catholic is, is not one of community. It is one of mm -hmm. going to mass mm -hmm. for one hour or hopefully less. And hopefully you can go to the mass without music and then get home even sooner. <laughs> um, there's, there was not a whole lot of community in my life as a Catholic, um, where I grew up. So I'm sure many Catholic churches have great communities and they have a fellowship hall. That was not part of my experience. And it wasn't something that 
we were doing real intentionally here at Nativity. And so that became part of the vision mm -hmm. of the church is that we were going to intentionally do community. And then the other part, as the church grew, once, once we did uh, make some of those changes, the church began to grow just by word of mouth. And it became... Um, a little bit too big to like really care for everybody. Mm -hmm. And, and so small groups became what we called our delivery system for member care. If somebody had a baby, if somebody had a death in the family, the small group is who gathered around because the priest can't go. We, we only have one priest here oh. and he can't go to everybody's house, right? He can't do every anointing. Right, he right. can't. Well, 2000 um, people know. <laughs> right. <laughs> And now it's, it's even more than that. We have, you know, probably 5,000 families now that are mm. members here. So, um, so the small group ministry really, um, came in and kind of filled that role of member care as well. Yeah. So when you were, because it was such a different model than what typically is in the Catholic church, um, how did you go about, uh, putting that into place? I mean, you had the vision part. So clearly um, the priest, who your main pastor, had the vision for how do we create community. So you started having to change values, right, almost from the ground up. Yes, it's very um, much of a culture shift, I mm -hmm. guess. And um, we probably started changing uh, programs before we put values into place. Now we have values in place that we, you know, kind of live by as a parish, but um, back then when we first started doing it, I, it was more of just a like grassroots, like let's invite some people mm -hmm. to be in a small group. And like I said, there was only, there were only two small groups when, um, the first time that we did mm -hmm. a push, oh, three, actually, I'm looking at my notes here, three groups. <laughs> um, and we're, you know, we used the lectionary and so we just wrote some mm -hmm. small group questions based on the lectionary for that week. So people were kind of hearing the readings in yeah. mass, then later in the week, kind of maybe answering some questions about those. Basically a sermon discussion guide, but when using yeah. the lectionary, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, that was our first curriculum. And then the associate to the pastor um, put together a, a leadership team, a small group leadership team, oh. some people that uh, seemed to care about this a lot. And then he started creating his own curriculum and kind of tracking the people that were in groups. I don't even think we were tracking people the first time we did it. And so we were looking at saddleback strategy and then we moved to like a North point strategy and now we land somewhere in the middle there. Um, so yeah, that was kind of, that's, that's how we began. Yeah. So if you are uh, listening and you're wondering how to take a bite at this big, enormous task of creating a culture of community and small groups. Uh, Kelly's Church has done it by taking a tiny bite at a time. So if you were going to give them advice, like what are some few things to kind of get, um, you know, get going on that are early steps if you're trying to change a culture of a church towards uh, small group communities? Well, I would say the the, um, for us, the most important thing is the message. You know, when our, pra mm -hmm. when our pastor preaches about small groups, um, it's it, people listen to what he tells them to do. I don't know. I don't know if that is, uh, across uh, all Catholic churches or churches in general, but, um, the priest is looked up to as an, authority figure. And mm -hmm. so when he preaches about small groups, uh, you know, he invites a lot of um, feedback into the room and the small group director is in the room. I'm in the room. There's a whole message team. We come together and we kind of craft a message about community, um, about small groups, about, and, and so I guess it starts with the, the message from the pastor. Does that make sense? Right. Yes, absolutely. We, we talk a lot about getting the um, pastor on board or getting buy-in from leadership um, especially um, some sort of, we, we. I think it's so interesting because you said, you know, the priest speaks with a lot of authority and that is kind of built into the Catholic uh, mm -hmm. model. I, I think for Protestant churches, it really varies greatly depending on if they're mainline or non-denom or whatever. And I'm sure senior pastors would say, um, would, you know, disagree about how much authority they get to have or not have. <laughs> 
stuff. Yeah. Um, but but regardless, uh, leadership is leadership, and so what they hear. Um, with authority of scripture behind it is going to have impact. So um, yes, it absolutely makes sense that you want to make sure if you want to make this culture shift um, or you're going to lead a campaign of some sort that you need to have the leadership on board and teaching about it. So the messaging piece for sure and preaching yeah. about it. And that's great that you guys have that support from the platform. I think that's a challenge for some of our listeners because they're pushing that uphill and leadership is not quite as bought in. Yeah. So. Well, that, let me say something helps. else about a small bite that you could take if your pastor's not on board. Um, we have also done events that we call connection events where we invite people to come to an event, whether it be a happy hour or mm. an outdoor event or something like that. And we provide um, some time for some table discussion. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of model what it might look like to be in a small group. And then we invite those people to get into a small group. Hey, did you enjoy your time around the table? Of course they did. We had great icebreaker questions and then yes. invite them into a small group. So that's another like just small yeah. begin that culture yeah. shift. For sure. And that's a great idea. If you can even do it really casually after services, now that people are coming, have come back, um, it's, you know, people are lonely and have been disconnected. So that might be a really good time to do it. We used to call those taste of community and they would just commit to a few, like, you know, a few different homes for appetizers or something low key just to get a taste of, oh, these are people that worship with you. <laughs> Let's get yeah. to know a few people. <laughs> Yeah. Which seems so yeah. simple, but man, it's, it's, you know, for, it, for, it's, it wasn't for me either. I, I mean, I, I'm kind of in the middle of introvert extrovert, but mm -hmm. I don't want to walk into a group of people. I don't know yeah. and, sit and talk to them about God. Now I get it. But you know, 15 years ago, I didn't right. want to do that, but it was the personal invite that got me to do it. Yeah. And it's, you're absolutely right. So we always say, you know, you're better off if you invite and sometimes people will say yes, but it's, it does to kind of lower the threshold of um, walking into a group of strangers talking about your deep, dark, you know, right. secret yeah. things it, that just yeah. doesn't work. So yeah, the little taste it helps. Um, and then you also oversee discipleship. So is small groups then integrated into your discipleship overall um, programming? Yeah. So that's interesting too. That was something we started to learn at Accelerate. I mean, we've been thinking about it for a couple of years, but we weren't, we weren't doing it well. We weren't incorporating um, our discipleship steps into small group. Rather, small group was one of the discipleship steps. Being in a small group was a discipleship step here at Nativity, right? The fellowship step. And so when we came back from Accelerate, we, we started thinking that, um, I mean, it's, it's obvious to, to probably a lot of your listeners, it's probably obvious, but it wasn't to us that if you're in a small group, you're more likely to mm -hmm. follow Jesus. You're more likely to um, take the discipleship steps that you're hearing about up the week in the weekend message. You're, we find that people in small groups are like a very high percentage more likely to give, to tithe. Mm -hmm. We find that they, people in small groups are way more likely to go on a mission trip. People in small yeah. groups are way more likely to join a ministry team. And so now instead of small groups, joining a small group being like a menu item, that mm -hmm. is the discipleship step we want people to take first. That's if we fantastic. Can. When they join a ministry team, of course they can. If they want to yes. just serve and not talk to people, that's fine. You can start there, but we're going to keep inviting you into a small group. That's so great. So you've made it the centerpiece kind of of, yeah. of the package. And you're absolutely right. Studies prove that over and over, that people that are consistent in groups um, do all of the things that we would value, the evangelism, the giving, um, you know, ministry, serving, all of those things kind of fall because it ends up being, assuming it's a healthy small group, not all small groups do this, assuming it's a healthy one, then um, those things naturally become an outflow of their community. Um, but I think churches still, majority of churches probably still kind of have the menu item concept, the buffet concept versus what we call the plated meal, um, where, you know, you're, you're helping people know what to put on their plate. And because you know what's healthy and best um, for that, they need parts of those things. So that's great. So you guys were able to change that into kind of the main um, way you get people discipled is through we're the groups. On it. We're still working on that. Um, that plan. That's, a cult that's a culture shift. 
big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think churches that have tried to do it, and believe me, I've also tried to do it with limited success, is that um, <laughs> there's a lot of people vested and a lot of systems that are vested in a menu model. And then there's also um, there's also this value, which is a legitimate one, that you want to make lots of things available because people have, have a lot of different needs um, and a right. lot of different entry points into church and into the life with Jesus. And so we don't want to close that off by creating, you know, a one path so it's kind of it's it's really a challenge to design something where you want to make community at the center because we do know that that works that's how discipleship happens but at the same time you need to create these additional um entry points alongside it for people with different personalities different backgrounds different experiences in church so i i think that's always going to be a tension in most of our churches yeah absolutely i i when you said entry points it that's sort of what we're working on right now is kind of each, each, I don't want to say level of person, but kind of like their level of engagement here, each level of engagement, we're trying to come up with three different entry points, but small groups mm -hmm. is on every single one of those entry points. So we have a couple easy, you know, the crawl, walk, run yes. model of entry points for each kind of level of engagement of person that we have here. Right. And I would say one of our biggest challenges is we get a lot of young families Mm -hmm. And this is when I came back, whose child is in second grade, their oldest child's in second grade. And that's when you get your first communion. Mm -hmm. So the grandpa, we have this whole culture thing. The grandparents are encouraging when, when is Sally getting her first <laughs> communion? And I love the grandparent voice. <laughs> 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 so I didn't sound like, but I don't know. Maybe it's perfect. <laughs> and um, and so we get a lot of young families returning, and um, they and some of them just want to check the box. But we we hope to just flood them with love and hospitality mm -hmm. and grace for that feeling of just wanting to check the box. But um, we we have ways that we're communicating. Well, but there's more for you here. We want more for you. We're not asking for more from you. We want more for you. Mm -hmm. And so does God. And and so we have really worked on that over the years. But that's I bet you that's probably one of our biggest challenges. And those same young families are really difficult to invite into small groups because they have little kids. And so yeah. we don't know how the non-denominational churches are doing that or other churches in general, but it's just really hard because we don't do small groups on campus. So we're not offering mm -hmm. childcare. Right. But I think like for me, and you said you went to a Bible study too, when you were a young mom, that changed the trajectory mm -hmm. of my life and my family's life. And as we're missing that, demographic of people in our small groups. Yeah, I think um, we could do a whole separate podcast on child care stuff. And if you actually <laughs> um, search on Small Group Network's website and put in child care during groups, there are lots of articles on our blog, as well as I've done a podcast years ago on childcare um, and the different options. And if you put that in Facebook, I'm sure people will clue in. So there are different ways to do it, but you're absolutely right. Like, I love what you said. We want more for you and not just from you. Like that spirit of hospitality is so beautiful. Um, and it's probably so winsome, especially if they came from a background where they thought Catholicism was all about um, doing the things and the tasks. Um, yeah. And instead, you're offering a relationship um, and a welcoming place. So, it's yeah, I could see how that would be really winsome. So does your congregation run younger then because of that? Because a lot of the Catholic churches in our area tend to skew much older. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, that's interesting. I think ours probably did at one time, and then when we started to adjust the culture, and you know, we're, we're playing um, more modern Christian worship mm -hmm. music. We don't. We do not do hymns anymore, and I mm -hmm. miss the hymns too. Everyone, I like hymns. Um, we do both. <laughs> we do both. Yeah, we only do like the modern. We have a like a ten piece band and. Um, we started to see young people coming back. So we have mm -hmm. a big mix, but it's mostly young families. Our target guy is, um, is t we call him Timonium Tim. So Nativity's <laughs> in a town called Timonium. So we, we, it's, it's our Saddleback Sam. It's our target guy. He's 45 years old. He's got a couple kids. So that's our target guy. There's lots mm -hmm. of young families around here. So if we wanted to engage more um, or welcome, and you gave us some tips already, um, to welcome people from Catholic backgrounds in our 
um, Protestant churches. What are some things you'd recommend um, that we kind of are careful about or that would be more inviting? I, I just feel like there's this divide between the two um, and people say Catholic as if it's not Christian. And maybe just like there's Christian churches that aren't Christian, I, I just feel like it's really a person by person thing. Um, and we joke about our church being the biggest um, Catholic church outside of the Catholic churches because we have a lot of ex-Catholics here. I meet one probably every weekend. We have a lot. And they're very similar to your story. Like they were raised in it and then fell away and kind of did their own thing, but now kind of want and feel the need, especially during COVID and post. Like whenever they deal with something hard, they come back. And then I kind of want to invite them into small groups, and invite them to more of the life of the church. But there seems to, it, it seems harder because it's not vocabulary they have or an experience they've had. So what mm -hmm. are some tips, Kelly, you can give us when we talk to Catholic brothers and sisters and we're inviting them into groups? So you mean not the other Catholic churches trying to partner with them. You mean the people that you have that are former Catholics. Yes, that that are, yes. and I'm sure a lot of our listeners also, especially if they're non-denominational churches, kind of like the one that you started out with, um, mm -hmm. they're going to have Catholics wander in. We have uh, women's Bible studies that have a lot of women that go to the Catholic church down the road for mass, but come to Bible okay. study at, at our church or come to MOPS. Um, so we've got a number of, and they always identify themselves as, you know, I'm either ex-Catholic or I grew up Catholic or they typically, there's some identification. And then I feel like we don't really know what to quite do with that. So I'm really asking for me, like, what, what can we do to kind of invite them in a winsome way and to kind of get over the hurdle of this is kind of what non-denominational churches do, small groups versus like what Catholic churches do. Um, that is a really hard question. I, I, I feel a little stumped. I'm thinking about my experience at the non-denominational church and, um, I can tell you what I was really uncomfortable with. Yes. You... Let's do that. What not to do is always really helpful. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the worship music was really uncomfortable for me. I did not understand why it was so loud and like <laughs> rock bandish. Um, I was very uncomfortable with people who would want to pray out loud Mm. Um, for me, uh, particularly if they wanted to put like their hand on my shoulder, like I wanted to run to my car when that happened. And I did a couple of times I would just leave. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this. I don't know what's going on here. Um, so I feel like there's baby steps that could lead up to that. Those things. Um, I was really open and I, it still made me really, really uncomfortable. Um, yeah, the prayer one, the prayer one is a good one actually. And I have coached, uh, small group leaders that if they have, uh, people from different spiritual backgrounds uh, and Catholics would be one of them, but there's a bunch of others where they're not used to the practice of praying out loud in a personal sort of way versus reading a prayer or, um, having it happen in the worship. Yeah, which is really different. Like if yeah. you grow up in the tr in the Protestant church, like I did, like praying out loud is kind of you learn that really young, along mm -hmm. the way, and so it's not weird. But um, I know that's a really off putting thing, and it's kind of scary because then they're sitting there stressed out because they're wondering if they're supposed to pray and do, is it okay if they down? And so we typically try to train people to say, don't push, push that just, and actually articulate that in your group. It's okay yeah. if you're not comfortable praying out loud yet. Yeah. Um, if you would, yeah. Yeah. Just, um, you can just sit and listen and, you know, and if someone's praying over you, but you know, you're not required to do anything, then you can kind of relax. Um, yeah. but it's better to just actually say it and that's across the board. It's not just Catholic. I mean, a lot of people are not comfortable praying mm -hmm. out loud. So why do we make that a, you know, a thing like everyone has to do it that they, they can take their time. Right. You know, it's okay. It. It's, it's a spiritual gift that God gives some people too. And some people might not have the gift of being able to express that out loud. But I remember in what the first year I was doing that Bible study, my leader called on everyone. She's like, everyone's going to pray out loud. We're going to go around in the circle. And I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. The classic, classic. <laughs> I can say it uh, in our father for you, but I'm not going to pray out loud. So like, I was really uncomfortable with it, but um, I'll have to think about, I'll have to think about the rest of the answers to that question. We can talk on Facebook. 
about yeah, no, that Yeah, no, that's fine. But like when you're training your leaders, and we can go right into there. So I know you have a very robust program for your group launch. Um, you have all the steps. You're, you're super organized with it. So you've got the prepping, the planning, um, and I'm sure coaching when you know when you get to the coaching part or the training part you probably do train around some things that are unique because of that background like you probably wouldn't take communion as a small group um i would imagine because that that's the eucharist is, is so sacred and it's a sacrament mm -hmm. whereas um some other churches uh, taking communion together as a small group is a really meaningful part of what they do so there's probably things that are like just a little yeah. different on the ritual side but can you walk us through kind of um you know you've had now a couple successful small group launches um so tell us your secret what what is the you know what are some in the in the next few minutes um what are some key pieces that you think are um have been helpful for you guys to launch these groups well, we, we always, we were on a yearly rhythm of inviting people into small groups. We do it twice a year. We have a, we kind of work, I don't know if all churches do this, but we work on like the school year calendar. So, yeah. um, okay. And so the summer's a little quieter. I mean, we're still doing mm -hmm. messages and mass and everything, but, um, we launch small groups in the fall, usually in the middle of October. And then we launch again, um, a couple weeks before Lent. And the draw is usually to get people into the small group for the next series. So we'll heavily promote the next message series. Um, that's for the fall. And, and so we always have that in mind when we're planning the message series for the year, that that second series of the year is going to be like a, a little deeper or, or a little bit, you know, tailored to Timonium Tim, something that um, mm -hmm. Tim and his family would like to be involved in. And then in, in the spring, we're sort of leveraging Lent and the fact that people want to do something more for the 40 days of Lent before Easter. Yeah. And so we kind of leverage that. Um, so that's the first thing we do is we have that yearly rhythm of invitation. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing I would say is that we always plan it like it's an event. Like this is an event mm -hmm. that is happening this weekend and we invite people to the event. And our most successful launch, which we just had this spring, was um, we started communicating it in December. Um, oh, wow. We, yeah. We, so we just started like dripping it on social media. Big things mm -hmm. are happening. We, we're praying for a revival here at Nativity. Mm -hmm. You want to be a part of this. So we started dripping it on social media and in some of our communications with our like inside people, our ministers and our current small group leaders. Um, and so there's always a weekend that's launch weekend. And like I said, we plan a big event around that weekend. We might have food trucks. We might have games outside in the mm -hmm. parking lot. Uh, we have a giveaway. We've had like Chick-fil-A cow here. So it feels like a party. Yes. And it's, okay. there's, there's so much energy around it that mm -hmm. it's really hard not to want to be a part of it. I would say. Oh, that's great. So you, you make it fun, you add it, um, you give a teaser along the way, like that drip it in <laughs> along yeah. the way. Um, and you also go with what you already are is already high value. The uh, Lenten season is much more meaningful for Catholics and in terms of just some of the practices, the lectionary, some of those things than it would be for some other churches. And so you build into where people are naturally going to be inclined to be thinking spiritually and um, wanting to engage more deeply. So that makes sense. It's kind of like we typically do it after after Easter, um, because okay. it's because that tends to Easter tends to be the height, and then people are like, "Oh, what do I, you know, how do I follow up yeah. on that?" So I think that's that's just good to know, kind of work with what's already um, in your calendar. So then you have this event, and then the training piece. Are you doing that before? Are you finding your leaders in advance? Are you doing the you invite from a few friends, and you just launch the the groups just in the moment at the event? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, we usually have all the groups set up before the launch. And so we recruit, we recruited leaders ahead of time. And one of the ways that we did that is we asked our current leaders to nominate somebody mm -hmm. um, from their group who could lead a new group. And then we also asked leaders this just for this launch, this was new, and it was our most successful. So I'll just share that. Um, we asked leaders to step out of their current group for Lent, just for the seven mm -hmm. weeks of our Lent series, and lead a group. And we trained them ahead of time. We had several meetings with them. We had coaches. We had several meetings. We trained them ahead of time to understand that their part of their purpose in leading this Lent group was to pass off the leadership to someone else right. in the group. There's right. always another leader, right, waiting. Um, 
And so, uh, yeah, so we, we trained, uh, th- a lot of those leaders were already small group leaders, so they didn't need a ton of training, but we had uh, a coaching structure in place for new leaders and we coached them before the launch. And then we had all the groups set up on our website mm-hmm. so that people could just go in and choose a small group they wanted. So that's like having a really excellent follow-up plan. Yeah. Uh, so we haven't always done a great job on follow-up and people fall through the cracks. And um, we've actually acknowledged that from the pulpit, like, Hey, if you've tried to get in a small group before and we have failed you, you know, we're sorry, but we're asking mm. you to try again. Um, we're, we're, you know, we get better every time. Um, and so we have open groups and, and uh, you know, we use a ministry platform database. And so the groups are on the website and you can just click and, send a message to the leader. And our goal is that we follow up with people within 48 hours of their request. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Gosh, so much, um, so many nuggets from what you said. So acknowledging that sometimes people fall through, I mean, every, that happens everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I, I love that just to kind of be upfront about it. Cause if people have had one bad experience and no one got yeah. through to them, um, you know, I think that goes a long way to kind of healing that and giving them a desire to try again. And yeah. then, um, you know, Kelly, I love the, the concept. I know everyone's always struggles with getting new leaders. That's kind of the meat and potatoes of our roles. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, and, and I think an, a creative way to do that is what you shared, which is to invite existing leaders, especially really strong ones and good ones, to mm-hmm. um, multi- to multiply themselves basically mm-hmm. by stepping out um, because they have their relationships with their group and they want to continue. But stepping out, I have done that before. And what's been so interesting um, when they came to the end of that season that I asked them to do six weeks or eight weeks. A lot of times they wanted to stay, even though the expectation was that they would pass off. So they would pass it off, but mm-hmm. they also wanted to stay in touch because um, they kind of, you know, planted this. So mm-hmm. yeah, some of them then became like they would have three with this one guy, a couple, they had three and then they would visit them, all three of them on, a, you know, on different yeah. occasions. It kind of like siblings, you know, you would just go visit. And then once in a while, they would have like a Christmas party with all together. Um, and that was, it didn't always work that way. This was an exception because of who they were and kind of what their ministry looked like. But it was mm-hmm. really cool to see some of them kind of said, okay, we'll do it. But we really aren't thrilled about it. I will do it because you asked, Carolyn. So then they did. And they're like, oh, that was really fun. Um, and now we have, you know, these additional, um, you know, these are older couples that have a little more time. And so that's, that's a really good model to try. So if you are struggling as listeners, if you are struggling with getting new leaders, ask if some of your existing leaders will step out for a little bit, um, just to seed and plant a new group. Um, mm-hmm. because it, when then the people in the group can see this isn't that hard and they are more likely to take over after. So that's a really good nugget. Um, anything else? I know you have some formal training stuff and you do some weekly things and I've been on your website and I'll link that in the show notes. You have curriculum, you have podcasts, like talk to us about all the different training um, platforms you use and how um, what you have seen to be effective there. Um, okay, sure. Yeah, we have a we have a pre meeting email that goes out, and that email has in it that goes out every week to every single person in the group. It has a little message from our small group director. It has the me- the weekend message linked in there, so you can watch the message mm-hmm. from the weekend that the pastor gave. It has the small group we call it small group video podcast, if that's a thing, because. <laughs> <laughs> we do it like a podcast. There's a host and there's somebody answering questions. We video it so you can watch it with your group or you can listen to it in the car on the way to your group. It's about 10 minutes long. Mm. And then there are some questions related to that video. And so it's all related to the weekend message, but it's kind of going deeper into the weekend message. Mm. So we're still, we still use that model, um, that we're going off of the weekend message. Um, So the other kind of, I guess some other ways that we train our groups is uh, just by providing tools on the website, which you said Mm -hmm. you'll post. We have a lot of tools for leaders on our website. Um, We do have uh, what we call group life directors and they um, take a segment of our small group. So we have um, couples, mixed adults, young adults. We have college age kids. We have women's groups and men's groups. Mm -hmm. And for each of those six categories, we have a couple of group life directors and they coach those leaders. So I I know Saddleback calls them 
community leaders, maybe mm-hmm. something like that. So it's a similar model to that. Um, and we create the content by just stealing all of Saddleback's content. <laughs> Which are all very available for our yeah. small group network people. <laughs> and why reinvent yeah. the wheel? So you have these volunteers. So they're, they're basically function as community leaders over coaches. So you have as, as your, um, you have, how many groups do you have now? Cause it seems like you need the different layers for the number of groups you have. Yeah, we have about 240 groups right now. That's incredible. From starting yeah. out with two or three, see the mustard yeah. seed, you can yeah. be encouraged. That's amazing. Um, and because you have that coaching structure and the accountability structure, you're protecting the health of, of those groups. Um, so Kelly, thank you so much for your time. You can interact with Kelly or ask her questions. You can ask her all things Catholic as well, if you'd like. Although they're, yeah. they're really interesting of a hybrid of sorts. It's like you've picked the best stuff of, um, mm-hmm. both traditions okay. and. Yeah. Yeah, of both traditions. And so you're doing community so well there. Um, so thank you for assuaging my curiosity about um, how this works in a Catholic context. And hopefully we'll get more, um, you know, more Catholic churches to be part of the small group network so we can learn and grow together. That'd be great. Yeah, maybe that's a huddle you could start, Kelly. You see, okay. how, see how that goes. Wouldn't that be fun? It'd be kind of different um, to yes. that online. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and your church and your uh, small groups director are also in a huddle in Baltimore, I believe, in that area. So if you want to connect with that, you can also connect with Kelly on that. Um, mm-hmm. So thank you so much again. Have um, God bless you and your ministry. Thanks, Carolyn. Bye, everyone. Um, <laughs> and thank you all for listening to Here to There. Until next time, remember, we are better together. Thank you for listening to Here to There, part of the Group Talk Network of Podcasts. If you like what you've heard, make sure you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. If you want to learn more, make sure you check out smallgroupnetwork.com for more resources.